All right, thanks for coming, for joining us today. We have uh, three of several, three of many uh, of our professors who were our MOOC pioneers, people who were teaching our first massive open online courses to tens of thousands of people. And we appreciate the invitation, Larry, and uh, the program committee to talk with you this morning. I'm going to start by asking each of them to just to introduce themselves, uh, primarily because I know them all so well it didn't occur to me to Google them. And it, as, as I stepped toward the uh, front of the room this morning, I realized I don't know their exact titles. I don't know, uh, I know a lot about them, but I don't know enough to really do an introduction justice. So while they're doing that, uh, go ahead and I'll be uh, preparing for my next comment here. We're going to invite you to send questions. Go ahead and please introduce yourself, Anthony. Hi, uh, I'm Anthony Robinson. I'm a vice provost for online education at Penn State. Yeah. See, I was going yeah, to say, I uh, that. Most of you are on your devices. Some, some of you multiple, so I'm just trying to <laughs> wake people up a little bit. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm lead faculty for online geospatial education programs in uh, the Department of Geography, the John A. Dutton E. Education Institute, the College of Earth and Mineral Sciences, and I taught uh, map, map MOOC. Good, thanks, Anthony. Uh, let's see, what, what can I make up about myself? Hmm, uh, not really. So I'm an associate professor of mechanical engineering and engineering design. I'm in the College of Engineering, but I'm located at Penn State Great Valley. And uh, I was one of three instructors for the Creativity, Innovation, and Change MOOC. And I want to point out that one of my co-instructors, Jack Matson, is also here this morning. And Daryl Veligal was the other instructor. And um, Let's see, I can't think of anything. One really thing you forgot creative. is your name. My name, yeah, yeah, I don't know my name. My name is Catherine Yablico, sorry about that. And um, I've known Kyle for a good long time and could tell some interesting stories, but I won't. But don't, yes. No. Thank you. Anna. Uh, my name is Anna Davinsky. I'm lead faculty of the Digital Arts Certificate Program, and I teach art online for the College of Arts and Architecture. I also teach um, studio courses for University of Pittsburgh, and I'm an artist. Thank you. So as moderator, I did do the other important part of my job, which was formulate a few questions that I'm going to uh, use to extract the wisdom of some of the wisdom that these professors have. But we're also going to invite you to send questions. So you'll see on the big screens here that there are two ways you can send questions. You can send questions through text, or if you have a, a device that's online, you can actually go to the website pollev, P-O-L-L-E-V dot com slash PSU WC. I should have done the WCFD thing, but I didn't. Just <laughs> WC, World Campus, Penn State World Campus. If you go there, there'll be a little text box. You can type your question in and hit submit. If you go the text route, just use your cell phone. And the address is the 37607. So you use that as if it were a phone number to which you are texting. Then as the first word of your text, you'll put in the 514406, which will remain at the top of the screen, a space, and then your question. So those are two ways. A third way that I'm thinking of including at the end is just voice. But if you want to use this, what I was thinking is people can see that, and we can sort of roll those in. And you can not have to hold questions till the end. So feel free. So I have a text ready to go. So I'm going to demonstrate. When I sent my text, it's going to pop up on the screen. <laughs> and everybody except the people who need to see it will be able to see it. Cool. However, I, have a, I also have my laptop here where I can read the questions to them. The idea was that they might be able to look through your questions and say, ooh, I like this question. I'd like to comment on that. But since they can't see it, maybe we'll just, I'll just hand them out. So two ways you can get your questions in. With that said, I'll get the, the uh, ball rolling by going to my questions, uh, which begin with uh, congratulations on completing your first MOOC. Uh, how did it go, and what, was it what you thought it would be, and what surprised you? Uh, what would you do differently next time? And feel free to ignore any or all of those questions. So pick from among those. Anna, do you want to start us off? Sure. Um, I was really surprised by um, everything, pretty much. I was surprised that um, the MOOC that I taught was an introduction to arts. So it was specifically designed for students without any previous art experience. And I was extremely surprised that there were a lot of professionals within the MOOC, uh, professional artists, photographers, um, digital artists, uh, teachers. And I think there were many reasons for them to want to be in the MOOC. Um, some of them wanted to try a new medium. Uh, some of them really liked the idea of having a set schedule where they had to generate work for every week. And some of them, I think, were interested in teaching and 
wanted to see an approach. Um, I was surprised by how committed and serious the students were. They came in and you know, we made the rubrics and the directions very light because that's what I was told that, you know, most students are not going to spend a lot of time on their assignments and it was completely the opposite. They were so committed and serious and they were uh, learning within the course but then they were going and doing additional research and spending hours and days on their artwork and they were just taking it very seriously. Um, I was also surprised how quickly people self-formed groups. They organized into groups to find community within such a big um, core, such a big community of people. And those groups were based on age and experience in art and background, language. Um, so, and also the professionals, the artists who were experienced were encouraging the people with less experience. So they were working together and helping each other out. Um, Great. Sounds like one thing I'm hearing is when you have tens of thousands of people in a course, yeah. you have hundreds of different reasons for them to be there yeah. and many, many different <coughs> levels of interest and experience. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else before we move it on? Um, I'll, okay. I'll add it later. Catherine, <laughs> we want to pick up from there? Sure. Um, I think I was surprised in, in addition to the seriousness and the amount of of effort that the students were willing to put in. Um, that was surprising for, for me as well because like you, I had this image that um, you know there would be students who, who were kind of dropping in and dropping out and, and they wouldn't have um, the same sort of motivation as a student getting a course for credit. And that was exactly the opposite. The students were, they were passionate about what we were teaching. They were passionate about being there. And I think the depth of that passion surprised me sometimes, that there were people saying, uh, saying things that you, you've, you've changed my life. You have, um, you've saved my life. You have um, changed the way that I look at myself. And you know, when you have a class of 30 people, maybe after 10 sections you get somebody that says that to you. But when you go into the forums and you read that every day, and it, it, it changes your view of yourself as the impact that you're having. Um, so that was something that surprised me. It also surprised me, I knew we were going to reach around the world. Mm -hmm. That's what we were told. But I didn't realize the extent still to that. It's still sort of mind-boggling mm -hmm. to see 165 countries show up in our MOOC and to see 130,000 people sign up and to see them talking to you personally. So if you think it's this impersonal experience, it's very personal. And they're making personal comments about how you've reached them and how you communicate them, with them. So the extent of that personal contact surprised me at times. Thank you. Anthony? You guys took all the good ones. Um, <laughs> That's why and that, that. Yeah, so this is harder. Uh, I guess just uh, jumping on Catherine's point about um, personal contact, I had the exact same feeling about the class. I really wasn't expecting to really talk to anybody in depth or, or make a connection like that. But like you said, within a few hours of the class opening, there were people providing these amazing reactions. I mean, some of them were amazingly negative. Uh, uh, so that, I mean, you know, we're, we like to, we're thinking now about, oh, it was over and we're remembering all the good stuff. Uh, it is pretty nerve wracking because you get, you know, complete opposite reactions to some things that you do in the course. Um, some people are very indignant about the free thing you made them. Um, so, and so that's, that, that can be a little bit challenging as an instructor because you're like, well, I, I made that for you. Like, he, you actually don't get to decide. Um, it's my, my decision. But, but there are many, many positive things that happen. And the global reach and personal interaction kind of came together to me. Um, uh, two weeks ago, I was actually in Singapore for a meeting, and um, I met quite a few students there. Just randomly, you happen to be at this meeting about mappings. It's not that random. Um, but one of them was just like kind of freaking out about it. <laughs> and it really made me feel uh, special, but also a little, I mean, very awkward. <laughs> I'm a normal person like the rest of you. So I just felt like I can't even believe this person cares. I mean, but, and, but for her, she had been watching these lectures and talking, I guess, uh, with me in the, in the forums, things like that. And so for her, it was absolutely a real thing. Um, so it, it is easy to kind of cast them off as like, well, there's no possibility that people will be motivated to do these things, um, find them valuable, or find personal connections in them to a faculty instructor like we would have in our sort of, quote, normal, smaller online classes. But I definitely think that that is possible given our 
three of us had almost identical experiences like that. Well, thank you. That reminds me, I mean, one of the articles I read that really made me mad said, these MOOC professors, they're just doing it because they have huge egos and they want to be loved by the world. They want to become, and, and I know so many of the people involved that I said, that, that really makes me mad. So I'm going to ask you, why did you do it? Why did you decide that a MOOC was the right thing, the thing you needed to do at this point? Why? Um, I think it was just a, a unique opportunity. And um, I really like the idea of people talking about art and making art and reaching out to so many people and having such diverse students. So it just seemed uh, like an incredible an incredible opportunity. I didn't even question. Right, and so you do, you had done the World Campus, so you taught Art 10 through World Campus, and then did the iTunes University. So you'd already yes. tried to give away yes, your content and so had given away like your content in another format. Yeah. Okay, Absolutely. Catherine, why'd you guys do it? it well, it, in the opportunity, the unique opportunity, and the, and the challenge of it, mm -hmm. I felt like this is the bleeding edge of of online technology, yeah. and as an engineer, I like to do things on the bleeding edge of technology. So, you know, let me try this. I've, I've taught world campus courses for five or six years, and that was sort of bleeding edge for me five or six years ago. Here, let's take this one step further. And, and I also had sort of a, a, a personal reason. I feel Penn State has been in the negative news for a number of years, and I felt like this is a chance to reach out to the world and say, you know, people at Penn State are really great people. We're a cool place. We're a good place, and we do good things. And speaking of great people, so Jack Matson, when he first came to me with the idea he wanted to do a creativity MOOC, he said something like, imagine if we can improve the creativity of hundreds of thousands of people around the world. I mean, what better can you do with your time than improving the creativity? So most people come from, and I, I guess I'm stealing your thunder here, but they come from a place of passion about what their, their content, and they want to share that with the world. And they know not everybody can afford a Penn State education. Anthony, did I just say what you were going to say? Thanks a lot, Kyle. All right. We're a great I, team. I did it because I have a huge ego. Oh. <laughs> That's what people want you to say, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a fixed term faculty member. I, I love being called a super professor because that's awesome. Uh, I would like to just be called a professor first. That would be pretty neat. That would be pretty, me pretty neat. Um, anyway, uh, so I actually really wanted uh, to achieve a very simple goal and I saw that it was possible through a MOOC and that was to teach people how to make their first maps. Um, so much like the, I mean, all three of us kind of had very basic level interest in, in our subject and wanting to get that out to way more people and these right now are a way to do that to tens of thousands of people. Um, on the other side of the coin, as a person that leads uh, online programs that are taught to traditional small size classes, very small graduate level courses, um, I want to see what these things can do and understand them really well so that um, I'm much more competitive at keeping us ahead of the curve and making sure that someone doesn't eat my lunch. Um, so it has very practical uh, level appeal to me too, but really the first thing was the chance to teach the biggest ever class in my discipline and help people understand what I think is so cool about mapping. Thanks. I, I see that uh, one of the questions that came in was something we probably should have addressed in the introductions, my bad, since I didn't do a formal introduction, <laughs> is what classes did you teach? So <laughs> could, you, could you sort of go ahead and talk about yeah, we'll the these courses and whether they're equivalent to an existing Penn State course or not? That's a great question. Uh, so my class was not a class that I currently teach or that we currently teach here um, for resident or a normal online instruction. Um, I built a completely new course that's designed to fit inside a MOOC. So for complete novice audience around the world, I, I designed toward that target. The class was designed to make your first map, um, tell a story with mapping, understand a little bit about map design, know enough to be dangerous, and hopefully become motivated to become a geographer or at least pursue, pursue some further learning in geography. So geography awareness kind of class. And uh, the, our course was called Creativity, Innovation, and Change, which is a course that Jack Matson has been teaching as a regular course here at Penn State. And elements of which I teach at Great Valley in the Systems Engineering Program and the Engineering Management Program, Daryl Veligal also uses some of the concepts he brought to the course in his chemical engineering courses. So we were taking three you know, instruction from three professors who have taught this material online and in the, in the classroom and integrating that into a single course. But there were definitely elements of it that none of us had done in a regular classroom, um, different formats, different projects, that kind of thing. But there was a basis in our, in our uh, regular teaching. 
Uh, my MOOC was called Introduction to Art, uh, Concepts and Techniques, and it's based on a course that I teach online here through World Campus. Um, it was, the content was exactly the same, but the delivery was very different um, to meet the MOOC requirements, a lot of copyright issues that come with images. Um, the workload was less than, obviously, than the Penn State course. Uh, the course focused on students making art and also writing artist statements. So they learned about different art movements and artists and techniques. Also, there were a lot of videos of me talking to the students and showing them different mediums and techniques, and then they had to address each assignment by creating an artwork, writing an artist statement, then uploading it, and then they would get matched up with partners automatically and critique each other's work. So in essence, they were teaching one another by providing one another with feedback. Thank you. So one of the questions that comes up a lot, uh, which was just entered four minutes ago, is how has teaching a MOOC changed your approach to teaching? So what, what's different now as you approach thinking about teaching and actually teaching? I can start this one. We'll start in the middle yeah. this time. Great. One of the things that I learned um, in the MOOC is the, the power of, of focused, simple messaging of what you say. So I think we, we have this luxury normally in a classroom of, you, know, you can talk for half an hour, you can talk for 50 minutes. I teach three hour classes, you know. When you know you have that time, you, you, tend, you know what you want to say that night, but you don't focus it down into chunks and pieces because you have the luxury of time. When you have to condense your important message into five minutes because that's about the length that your video needs to be, it makes you think about what you're teaching in a whole different way. So that was one thing, and that, that's tremendously powerful. I'm using it in my face-to-face -face teaching now. So I go in every night for my first lecture, and the first thing I say is a five-minute this is what we're doing tonight. And now the rest of the class then is developing that. Um, we also had for our MOOC uh, an acting coach, professor in the, in the theater department, Dr. Susan Russell, who taught us that students see you before they hear you. And so what they see and how you present yourself physically is a very powerful thing. And so I walk into my classroom thinking about that image and what I look like mm -hmm. differently than I did before. And so those are some things that, that will impact my teaching from now on. Thank you, Catherine. Anthony, we'll come to you next. In addition to thinking uh, a lot more tactically about making very, very tight learning objectives and uh, stuff that people around the world can sort of interpret um, very, very easily, um, it's also caught, taught me to be more open to other forms of engagement that are kind of parallel to the class. So when you teach a MOOC, right, whether you like it or not, there are things that happen on Twitter and Facebook and uh, in other countries, social media forums like QQ in China and Vcontact in, um, in Russia. And so I really enjoyed seeing the development of those things. And I'm a lot, a lot less shy now to introduce those things to my classes. And I used to, I used to feel like I'd be a creepy guy professor. Um, if I was saying like, hey, why don't we get on Facebook and talk to each other? Um, and now I'm a lot more willing to be like, okay, well, we're just gonna, I'm just gonna have this open at least, and if you wanna use it or something, that's fine. And I'll occasionally seed the, the page with those things because that was a really productive form of interaction um, in the MOOC, especially the, uh, for me, Twitter was, a, was an important way to, to staying in touch with people. Just providing another kind of way to cut through the noise. Uh, the classes are so massive and so diverse inside and there's so much chatter happening in my case, almost 100,000 posts in the forums in five weeks, that sometimes those parallel channels of information sharing are actually more effective at getting the people that are the most engaged to come back and try things again. Anna? Um, I think uh, for me also Facebook was extremely useful within the MOOC um, and it created such a tight uh, community of people who were sharing ideas and I really liked that. And um, I think in art it's extremely important for students to interact and to encourage one another. So I will definitely be incorporating that into my own teaching and creating a, an online, a, a Facebook group that's specific for the course. I think a lot of students would benefit from it. And I think for me, changing the tone, uh, being more encouraging in the wording of things, um, I think my the rubrics that I use right now for grading are very specific and detailed. But I changed them for the MOOC because I don't want to sound as harsh since 
it's not an equivalent to in the university level course. And I really like that. And I think um, just changing the wording and being more encouraging and warm and inviting at this, you know, while still evaluating them fairly um, is something that I'm going to incorporate into my own teaching. Thank you. So we have a, another question that says, uh, it started with why you taught the MOOC, which we've already covered. But then there was also, what sort of support or incentives did you receive from your college or department in order, in order to do this? <laughs> and from across the university. Actually, I, yeah. I look back. This person also yeah. realizes there were <clears throat> incentives or support provided beyond your own department and college. So what sort of ab what abnormal forms of support did you receive or incentives did you receive to do this? I have a very um, forward-thinking uh, boss, uh, Ann Taylor, who was willing to let me do this as part of my normal job. Um, so I, I added it on to what I do. I kind of carved out some time where there wasn't any. Uh, I stopped doing some small things that I do uh, normally. But at, on a normal basis, I kind of set my own teaching load in my unit. So I'm in a very unique position. Um, like I said, I'm not, an, I'm not a normal professor. Um, <laughs> so yeah. a lot of people want to know, they're like, how many classes did you get off? And I'm like, none, because uh, I just because I get to decide that every year. I think that's called prioritization. I've heard about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to consider um, that. I'll be honest with you, I, I mean, it's, it's a ton of work to make one and a ton of work to teach one, and it's very, very intense, and then afterward, there's all kinds of things you have to do as well. Um, but, uh, but if I had been, you know, I guess I could have asked for some more money. It doesn't seem like a, a huge, if that's the motivation, then don't teach a MOOC. I guess that would be my guidance. You're, you're, it's a really bad way to make more money because <laughs> you're going to work 40 times as hard as you ever have, um, so it's not efficient. Um, just do something normal. Uh, but. In terms of support and incentive from the university, there was tons. And our, we had our MOOC strategy group meeting that we still have every month, um, where all of us who are working on these things kind of get together and talk shop about what was happening. Um, I got the sense that there was a ton of support from, from central administration to make sure that these were successful. And that's followed up now and making sure that we did a good job <laughs> checking on us now before we run again. Um, certainly within my unit, I had the support of a learning designer, uh, Aaron Long, who did a lot of uh, work on making sure the course would work. And I know all the rest of us had teams of people um, that were helping out. Mine was relatively low budget as things go, so it was uh, me and learning designer and a little bit of part-time video assistant help, but I shot the videos myself and did a lot of the content uh, additions myself. I wrote everything, did all the graphics. Um, so there, there are various models and I, I kind of piloted that one, I guess. <laughs> so, so in addition to the, the, the support you were talking about coming from ETS and TLT and and the instructional design support that we got, which was fabulous. Um, the College of Engineering, in our case, um, also footed the bill for WPSU. It did the, the, the you know, fancy videos, and that was fabulous. Working with WPSU was absolutely phenomenal. We loved that experience. Um, I, I didn't get any course release for doing this, and I didn't get any supplemental pay for doing this. But I knew that ahead of time, and I, I, I did it because I wanted to do it. So that was not, that was not the driver for me. But um, you know, in our case, there, there were some things we wanted to do above and beyond. And we were very grateful to, to Jack Matson, who, who decided that some of his philanthropy to the university would be to our course. And, and that was fantastic, and we want to thank Jack for that. But a lot of moral support. So, you know, from the college, from Dean Wormley and, and Dean Engel, a lot of moral support in terms of this is fantastic. Um, supports from, from colleagues who were interested and, and intrigued by what we were doing. So there was a lot of, of that kind of community uh, bolstering when you were up at 1 a.m. answering forms because I just couldn't stop myself. It was just too exciting. Yeah. And, and COIL, we had money coming in from COIL and, and fabulous support from people like Kyle who were always being a cheerleader um, for us all the time. Anna? Um, I also wasn't compensated for this project, but I, because as we were talking about priorities, I just kind of made it part of my work, of my schedule. Um, our MOOC was offered, <coughs> the art MOOC was offered in the spring, uh, so kind of after this, in late spring, summer, so it worked out for me. I wasn't teaching anything at that time, so I was really able to commit my time to 
the MOOC. Uh, we had a really amazing team of people. We had um, Gary Chin from eLearning, Interim Director of eLearning Institute, and he was the, lead, the project lead. Uh, we had Angela Dick from, is she here? Um, hi. Uh, from TLT, she was an instructional <coughs> designer on the project. We had uh, Cody Goddard, Goddard, who was our videographer, and we had also a teaching assistant provided by School of Visual Arts, Amy Bloom, who is a PhD candidate in art education. Um, all of us worked very, very hard because we were the first MOOC to come out. We had a super short amount of time to customize the material to the MOOC requirements. Um, but you know, it was really incredible, and we all worked together, and we encouraged each other, and I think that's why it turned out well. Thank you. To, mm -hmm. <clears throat> to others outside this room, uh, that list of people helping might seem like a long list. The people inside this room know what it takes to put together a quality course, mm -hmm. so they're not surprised at all. To the people outside who may see this stream or, or uh, want to think about it, imagine that small team of people producing a course that reaches more people than all the other professors teaching that course in the world at that time, right? So you have one course. Some, some people think of these numbers and, and uh, you know, sort of dismiss them. Well, they started with 100,000, but they end up with only 6,000. Only 6,000. Wait a minute. That's 6,000. How many sections is that of a course? Mm -hmm. And how, you know, how much good have you just done around the world? And so it, it takes a village to sort of create and run one of these. Uh, but when you look at the return on investment, uh, it's huge, not necessarily for dollars, but that brings mm -hmm. us to the next question. So, <laughs> so how do you see MOOCs sort of coming back into the Penn State landscape? So we have a great, you know, large residential program with campuses, and we have the World Campus, you know, an amazing uh, uh, component of Penn, what Penn State is to the world, and now we have MOOCs. So how does, do you, have you, you've obviously given some thought about how that comes together, and is there a contribution back into the rest of Penn State? Where do you see it all fitting? So my class was actually uh, designed to fit a role as a gateway into my existing rural campus delivered programs. So it, it doesn't really explicitly say that anywhere, and I was, uh, much like Anna talked about last night, there's just tacit linkages to the programs that we offer and what we do. and. Um, it's about visibility overall, and very, very few times I sort of said something about, this is not what I do for my day job. <laughs> you know, here's what I do for my day job if you're interested. And that's actually led to a substantial uh, increase in interest in our programs for sure. Um, <clears throat> some new students that we're aware of already, and I'm going to work on ways to assess that soon. Um, excuse me. So uh, I'm, I'm very positive on these as ways to enhance the visibility of our university, of our colleges of our department's strengths um, as a way to get people in the door a little bit, um, get them excited about Penn State, understand what it is we do that's different and better than other schools. I think they're uh, quite possibly uh, the, the most excellent current way to do that for if you're looking to get totally different new audiences anyway. Um, I don't think that they are replacements for the vast majority of normal online teaching that we do to small sections of people, and especially in graduate courses, and I don't think they're gonna take over all of our general education or anything crazy like that. So in addition to the visibility piece, I want to um, note something that Kyle was talking about last night, which was the, the, the use of badges for learning, so competency-based learning. And I think that MOOCs could very well fit into the Penn State landscape that way by providing students with certain skills that they might learn and badges that they might earn within the MOOCs that could then be added up from other sources getting badging that would perhaps, maybe it's a, um, so they could test out of a course or maybe it's so that they could, um, you know, come into say a math sequence at a higher level or, or something like that. So, so like you, I don't see them replacing our bread and butter, but I see them enhancing it. And I can imagine too, you know, students who maybe are struggling with a particular subject or a particular course and a MOOC being the way that they can not only focus and learn that material more, but engage with people outside the university who know that material. So when we talk about students teaching each other within the MOOC environment, imagine a student who's, who's struggling with math 
and going out into a math MOOC and talking with people who are practicing math and applying it all over the world and having them say, yes, you know, this really is important. It really is important that you learn this topic and here's how I use it every day and, and let me help you because the students are amazingly generous with each other. So I can see it as being enhancements um, in all of those different ways. And I know the issue of monetizing MOOCs is, is on everybody's mind. And I don't know exactly how it's going to work out, but, but I know that with every other new technology I've ever seen, whether it was online or not, people will find a way. They will find a way to make it, to monetize it in, in valuable ways. But we have to provide value, and, and I think we do. You just said all the good stuff. <laughs> We'll start with you next time. <laughs> I think enhancing is a really good word. I really agree with you. And visibility. Um, our The digital arts certificate program is really tiny. And while we were running a MOOC, we had so much traffic and people uh, inquiring about applications. Uh, we've never seen that many. So that was just, <coughs> that was good for us to, you know, put that information out there. Um, also, as I mentioned yesterday, we were sharing videos. Um, of the faculty from the School of Visual Arts talking about the school, talking about the professors, the students. So putting information out there about what we have to offer and letting students know that we have this great university and education here. Thank you. The questions are really pouring in now. Thank you. Uh, the next one might be even a better question for Bart, but maybe you'll be able to answer it here. Uh, Bart Purcell is uh, in charge of the sort of, he's, I call him the data steward. So he's the one who makes the data from Coursera about all our, our MOOCs uh, accessible, which is a big job, much bigger job than it sounds. But the next question is, uh, do you know if your students were primarily adult learners mm -hmm. or traditional college or a mix? And I'm going to sort of en enhance that to say, what do we know <coughs> about the people who took our courses? Mm -hmm. And I'll let you take a swing at it. Bart, if you want to take a swing at it, I'll give you the, you want just you, okay. I think we had a mix. Uh, we had, but there were a lot of students who were educated. Um, there were a lot of students who were new to art, and some were experienced. Um, we we had some, um, you know, tables that showed that, which I don't have with me right now. But I think it was a mix. How about we we take some of that data and put it in the Yammer uh, site that, that Drew told you about? So we'll we'll get some of those charts and. <laughs> and post that in the Yammer site. So that's a really good question, which probably can't be precise, but... I know, I know a little bit about my class. Um, so I, one thing that surprised me was that, uh, and I should have known this if I had researched MOOCs a little bit more, but I've been making one, so I didn't have time. Uh, about 70% of the students in my class identified themselves as being male. Um, so my class was really... So it sort of shocked me how male it was. Uh, I mean, I wasn't... I was expecting it to be closer to 50-50s, given how geography typically is in America. Uh, my suspicion is that South Asian students were almost entirely males and very, very few females from that part of the world, and there were a lot of South Asian students in my class. So I'm looking now at sort of tearing apart that geography a little bit and looking at the geographic differences in my class a lot more. The uh, age range is question is a really good one. Uh, my impression is that the majority of students in my class were in the 30s kind of range. It's not. Um, the case in my course that the majority or even a substantial minority were sort of typical college age students. Um, they were, they tended to be older. Right. And I think that was similar for ours. We're just getting the, the data from, from the creativity MOOC, but I think early on we had a sense that they were, you know, over 20. Um, the average was over, tw between 20 and 40, let's say. But we definitely saw a range. I mean, there were some groups sure. in the forums that formed, there was a group of, of seniors. They were 80 years old and older that were working together, and then we had high school students. And, and it was cool to see that diversity of learner that I would never see here, but, but the sense was they were adult learners. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, just to put diversity thing, uh, you want to just come grab the mic yeah. start? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, one of the quick diversity notes about the MOOCs is we've reached uh, 198 countries, which is pretty wild. If you go and look at all the different people from around the world that have enrolled, some of those countries just have one person, right, represented one of the books, but it's a pretty interesting split. Uh, the U.S., I think, makes up about a third of our population enrolling in our moves. So it's a really, really uh, radically diverse group of students, which is really interesting. Thank you, Bart. So here's a real nice meaty question. So how did the peer assessment or feedback work in your course? Do you think it was valuable to the participants? 
Could you see this model of feedback working in a credit-based course? Well, um, in my course, that was the whole point because students were evaluating each other, each other's work. Um, I created a rubric they they had to fill out, which I'm going to revise and make it much more detailed because that's what the students wanted. And then they would provide one another with personal feedback that they would write within the rubric. Um, some students took it very seriously and they would spend hours, they would have to review only two people, some of them would review 30 people at a time, just because they really like looking at each other's work and providing each other with suggestions. Um, there were, of course, students who didn't take it seriously and would write something mean or, you know, it would upset other students. So it created some conflict within the course. Uh, why isn't somebody taking my work seriously? Why am I not getting a fair evaluation? But I think overall it was really effective. So maybe placing a more detailed rubric in place, providing very specific instructions and examples of a proper way to critique each other, I think will make it stronger. I really like that aspect and I'm definitely thinking of incorporating it into my own course here. Um, it, it was just, I think, the, the basis of the course and I can't imagine within an art book not having it. With the, with the creativity book, we actually decided to experiment with assessing things a slightly different way. We knew that the peer assessment you had used the peer assessment and other MOOCs were as well. And we said, we actually had a, a COIL grant to, to experiment a little bit with kinds of assessments. So rather than using the peer assessment, we gave the students the option of using the discussion forums as an assessment forum. And part of the reason was in the creativity MOOC, we were trying to teach them a process rather than content mastery. So we were more interested in were they following the process of generating ideas and selecting ideas and implementing things. There wasn't a right answer to have and, and we also felt we, we just wanted to experiment. So there were some positive things about using the discussion forums in that students felt um, I think a little bit less pressure to, to do the assessment in a particular way. But then again there were students who wanted more instruction on that. So I know that we're thinking about for the next iteration of our MOOC, um, again, experimenting with the peer assessment that Coursera has and they're actually working on and adjusting and several other methods of assessment. So that's something that for us is a, is a research area. I use peer assessment for, um, yeah, now we're down to, yeah, this one's on either. Uh, yeah. Uh, we use peer assessment in my class for just one of the assignments, uh, the last assignment, which is to make a map to tell a story. So it's kind of a final project. It's up to the students to gather some data now that they know how to make their own maps. Uh, I wanted them to tell a story with one and critique each other in, in very basic ways about the design of that, the effectiveness of the storytelling, and, and some, some other basic aspects. Um, I found that uh, assignment to be one of the most stressful for me to administer as the teacher in the course. Uh, because uh, I underestimated how many students actually know what peer review is. Um, I assumed that MOOC students knew that that was part of taking MOOCs, um, and most of them did not. So I needed uh, to step back a lot and say, okay, here's how this works, here's the evidence for why you use this method, because uh, some students were like, this can't possibly be a way to teach. Um, so I, I kind of had to fight against that a little bit and establish that it, it was a valid method for <clears throat> scaling up uh, interaction in a course like this. Um, I found it to be really valuable, you know, a lot of the students who are the most skeptical about doing it then said something later to the effect of like, I just reviewed 30 other projects just like Anna said, and this was like the best part of the class for me because I got to see what everybody else made. Um, so I really felt that it was a positive experience, I'll do it again. Uh, we've been using peer assessment of various forms in our normal online classes in the Dutton Institute and EMS for a long, long time. Um, so for me, that method, that, that's another reason why I kind of was like, well, we'll do peer assessment, of course. Um, so it didn't surprise me at all that that was an option and uh, like I said, I just needed to do a better job of communicating to the students as to how that method works, why, it, why you use it in a class like this and um, I, I do think it's uh, on whole, it's worth the sort of pain of delivering it um, because a lot of the students who take it seriously cite that as one of the most positive aspects of the course afterward. Thanks. Now I'm going to throw one in sort of a, a curveball here. What is it that you, as director of COIL, co-director of COIL, what is it you want to know that you don't know? In other words, what questions do you have now uh, that could be answered through research or, or what? I'll just leave it at that. Hmm. 
None. It's all perfectly clear. <laughs> let, the, let the record show that they, they... How can we scale assessment from me to the class for real? Not, not necessarily peer assessment because I actually would like to grade the maps. <laughs> so let's, I mean, that, that one thing that uh, kind of resonated with me with both uh, some of the things that Anna and Catherine have both said today um, is that there's this perception that if you teach a MOOC, you can't possibly interact with people and you can't do these things and you can't, can't, can't. And I, I'm really motivated when people tell me I can't do things. So I, I just, <laughs> I, a part of me wonders, like, is it really, Im is it actually impossible uh, for me to grade things in some way that's meaningful and, and we get a lot closer anyway to what, what I do with 20 people in a class. Is that actually impossible or is it just impossible right now? Um, so there, that's a really hard one. Thanks, and you, you can't give me 20 bucks. Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to see, I'd like to, to, to learn how far can we push um, learning beyond content mastery with a MOOC. So content mastery is, is probably the easiest thing to scale up. I present written material, I present videos, and I, and I see if you get it. But we were very focused on experiential learning in our MOOC, and I think we would like to push that even further. How can we, what's the best way to assess that and make sure that the students are actually having the experience you want them to have? And how far can we push, you know, I really admire you getting them to do physical artwork and things in an engineering sense. How far can I push experiential technical learning using a MOOC format? I would love to see how far we can push students to do inventing and experimenting and, um, and things like that that we think can only happen in a lab. I'm like you, Anthony. Don't tell me it's impossible because I'll go try it. Yeah. Um, how far can we push that? Anna, anything for you? Both of the things they said. Um, it would be interesting to have like a closed off MOOC where there aren't so many people. I mean, a lot of people, but not so many people. So it would be more of a controlled environment. Um, I think they're planning to do that with music right now. Um, and Clemens is. But one of the things that. Penn State's looking at is the massive open credit course yeah. or the massive. I don't know how open it would be because you wouldn't, it wouldn't be free anymore, but the massive credit course. Massive, massive online massive. credit course. Yeah. Massive yeah. online credit course. So that's one thing we're looking at is about scaling up and how can we scale up assessment and all those things. So we have an interesting question here that says, is it really about MOOCs or is it just about Penn State trying new and innovative things? Today it's MOOCs, tomorrow it may be something else. I, sure. Go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Yes. I mean, I, I yeah, that, that doesn't, I, in a lot of ways, like the, the MOOC strategy group we've been meeting with, we now are in like other kind of topic areas that are related to this, and that's been one of the discussions we've had is where does this discussion keep going forward? Um, because we've ended up talking about other models for distance education, the massive, open, uh, massive online credit course, I agree, that there's no possible way you can call that open anymore, <laughs> unless it's actually free. Uh, and even then, that's partly defined by open. So uh, I, I think there, there's uh, this meeting and uh, plenty of others that are happening here on campus and a lot of the other units on, on campus. We have tons of different e-learning units, including World Campus, but uh, you know other college level units too, are really focused a lot on innovative things in distance education. And that was, to my understanding, the reason to try MOOCs at Penn State was to see what they can do and what they cannot do uh, and be strategic about it. So I think it is about innovation, and it wasn't actually about necessarily MOOCs. Thanks. Before Penn State got into MOOCs, I, I had the opportunity to visit Duke University, which is one of the first five Coursera partners. And what I discovered there, I asked them, why did you do it? And they said, well, we're a research one institution. Our business is education. You know, this is an innovation in our business, and we're a research institution. We feel it's our obligation to be conducting research. We can sit back and let other people do the research, or we can study you know, how better to do, conduct our business. Let's find out the answer to all these questions. So I think that that's a really good question, and, and my answer would be it's not really about MOOCs, or it is really about MOOCs now, <laughs> and it's really about other opportunities for us to do our, do our job better. Drew, are we out of time? Ten minutes. Okay, good. That, that reminds me of, of, you know, do you want cherry pie or chocolate cake? And my answer is yes. <laughs> and, and so I agree with you. I think um, 
we are a research one university and we when I walk into my face to face classroom I'm, I'm walking into a laboratory I'm walking into a learning laboratory it doesn't matter if I have five students in the room or 30 students in the room or 130,000 students in the room I should be learning about what I do as an educator and so we can't we can't not look at this as a technology, but it's just, it's one of, a, it's one of the many that we'll continue to look at. Um, I, really, I really like the fact that Penn State is, is pushing the envelope with, with the other prestigious universities in this country, and I'm really proud of Penn State for doing this. Thanks, and when you think about it, I mean, we're, at Penn State, we have over 100 instructional designers on staff working in the World Campus and Earth and Mineral Science, and arts and architecture and other places. And we are a great place to really use this. When uh, I, I talk to people about big data and about data analytics and MOOCs, <clears throat> when you offer a class and it has tens of thousands of students in it, when you open week one, you know, on day one, you've had 3,000 people approach a learning activity. And you can see, you know, for whom it worked and for whom it didn't. Mm -hmm. You can offer, they, they offer, like to do A, B, you know, we're going to offer this in two different ways to people. And all of a sudden, as soon as you open the gates, you've had thousands of people run through. And if you have some, you know, if you get them to do a survey first, you know some demographic information, information about whether English is their primary language, you know, maybe background in the field and so on. And there's just awesome opportunity here. Unfortunately, the data uh, come in in a very uh, unfortunate way, and there's a, lot, there's a lot of work that has to go on before we can do a lot of that, but I think uh, you know there is a real opportunity. Talk about a learning laboratory and scale. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's really uh, I think marginally tapped potential. And we're in contact with people at Stanford. There's a Lytics lab that is a, a bunch of doctoral and uh, postdoc students, primarily with a professor uh, chairing it. That's really doing some interesting work in in looking at Stanford's MOOCs, not necessarily Coursera's MOOCs, but Stanford also is running. MOOCs through Coursera and elsewhere. And uh, it's a really interesting time in the history of online education. And we will be learning the curve will get steeper, uh, the progress and effectiveness curve will get steeper as a result of this. Other thoughts? Any questions from the audience? Maybe somebody didn't have a device. I don't want to, uh, I want this to be accessible to the people who have a voice but not a, not a digital device with them. Any questions or comments from the field? Jack, come on up. Can you take the mic, please? Jack Matson, uh, professor and ringleader of the creativity MOOC. <laughs> Have you ever been called that before? No, ringleader sounds like outlaw. And, may, and, and maybe to a certain degree we were in this course. Here we're teaching a course in creativity, innovation, and change out of the engineering college, which if you think about it, it has its psychology, it's everything but we're human beings and that's what we have been teaching innovative design and so forth in engineering. So it became quite natural to us to uh, extend. We did have a, a clinical psychologist also, John Belanti involved in looking at the change aspect and because once you become more creative, you're changing yourself significantly. And we had to warn the students and also uh, uh, have forums basically dealing with this aspect of, of not only behavioral change, but a change in their community. If they're trying to innovate uh, for some social reason, uh, that creates change and there's always resistance to that change and how do you, you handle it. So these questions came up as we were innovating on the course and from week to week. I suspect uh, in the other MOOCs too there was this uh, what's happening this week and maybe we better go in this direction rather than that direction based on the kind of instant feedback you get. And also I think all of us uh, flipped the course in terms of what we call flipping. In other words, we present the material uh, on Sunday and then we would have some Google Hangouts, at least two Google Hangouts, where we'd have students involved asking questions and so forth. So that was kind of our classroom where it was through Google Hangouts. So all of this was going on now. We're going to experiment with a Penn State course this spring, a freshman seminar course, where we're going to blend it. 
because the kind of course we have can be blended into practically any academic situation. And also, Penn State has moved toward an entrepreneurship minor in every college, including the branch campuses. And so this would be a nice course to blend into that minor, but we're gonna experiment with these freshmen in terms of how do we blend it and how is that blending going to work? It's going to be face-to-face, -face, but they're going to use our MOOC platform to do it. Also, we've decided, and Coursera wants to, that our MOOC is still open. We're passive about responding on it, but people can go in and take it informally. They can watch the videos. It's like having an e-book there that they can just pull off the shelf. And then one other thing we're doing, uh, which I think will provide more insight to us, because we really want to dissect this MOOC and find out what really worked, what the failures were, what we learned from those failures. So uh, we have now 70 submissions of what happened to you in the course, what changes did occur, and what caused those changes. And we hope to take the best of those and each of us faculty members also write a chapter in what will be an ebook that will serve as kind of a textbook for the, the course next fall. So that's kind of another part of the project that will both give us insight but give something tangible at the end that everybody that submits will have their own chapter and their own credit for, for doing it. So that's an, a, another exciting thing that's that's going on, but I wanted to bring up this question of blending and what the possibilities are there and, and whether that's being considered. That was my real question. Thanks. Anybody want to answer that question? I, I'll say that uh, Sebastian Thrun in one of his early MOOCs on computer science did that. He had his Stanford class, <clears throat> he made the MOOC available to his Stanford face-to-face -face class while he had it open to 120,000 people. This was one of the first AI artificial intelligence courses. And one of the interesting things he found was that his attendance in the face-to-face -face class dropped off, that many of his face-to-face -face students did take advantage of the MOOC. But he also found that there were 250 students in the world that outscored his top resident Stanford face-to-face -face student. So, you know, you talk about the quality of, of the people out there and the, the variety of the people who are in that course. So there were some who obviously didn't even have the prerequisites, but, you know, it's, it's quite an opportunity to, to blend. Imagine if those 250, uh, you know, people who actually were as capable or more capable were part of a community, you know, talking to each other and supporting each other. Uh, that, that could really be quite an advantage to merge other bright, very capable people who have an interest um, with the people in your resident class. And I think I know in, in the College of Engineering we're trying to encourage more um, global um, interactions, our students to, to interact globally. And I think this is a great way to do that. So even if you only send your students into your MOOC platform for pieces of it along the way, um, it, it, maybe they can't go visit and live in France or England or, or Germany for a semester. Maybe they can't afford it but they can interact with students from many other countries and cultures this way as, as part of blending into another course. And I think that, that helps them and it helps the folks in the other country learn more about us. I think it would be extremely important for them. I think it would really inspire them and push them and challenge them. Um, I think that would be a great idea. I think it would really work for me. Okay, any other questions? If not, there's one that came in about an hour ago that I saved for last. <clears throat> that was if you had to do it all over again, and I'm going to change that to when you do it over again, <laughs> uh, what would you change about the MOOC that you taught? In other words, what, what are the things on your list of next time I'm going to do, hmm. I'm going to work on uh, introducing the peer assessment like I mentioned earlier, making sure that people understand what that is, why we're doing it, the evidence behind using that method. That's one thing I want to work on. Um, I want to leverage the content that was created in the first class. So there were almost 100,000 posts in that first class, and many of them were really useful and interesting. I'm still trying to figure out how I might leverage that in a way that doesn't sort of de facto shape the next conversation that happens, but I do feel like I don't want to waste that uh, effort. It's, that's a huge corpus of information. Um, a really simple thing I want to do is talk about time zones right away. 
and say, and say if you refuse to understand which time zone you live in and how UTC time works, then I can't help you. You know, I just, because there were, I mean, I got a lot of email from people that were frantic at deadlines who, you know, their grandparents suddenly died and all kinds of things happened um, due to deadlines. And so I'd really like to get past the logistical barrier of deadlines in some manner in the course and be creative with that. I know in, in our MOOC, we, we talk about being in the forums and being present, and I think, Anna, you were talking about that last night. I would like to see in our MOOC more of, I'll call them teaching assistants, um, and, and one of the wonderful things that Coursera offers is something called community TAs. So they will go out now, and they'll, they'll do the, the, the um, detective work and identify the students that did the best in your class, and then they will invite them to be community TAs to help you um, answer questions in the forums and to interact. And so I think that's an important component for us because, again, it gives you presence. And Jack mentioned the, the entrepreneurship minor that's now going across the university. And because I think we were all in a race to, to get material there on time, entrepreneurship is something that we would like to, to add into the Creativity, Innovation, and Change MOOC. Um, to a higher extent, so in terms of content, we'd like to add that in. Um, yeah, it would be great to have more help TAs or community TAs, and I think Anthony and I talked about this before, that some people were so involved in the MOOCs that they were already like uh, sort of TAs who were helping people out, and they were on the discussion forums 24-7, co constantly commenting at night, all times of the day. Um, so that would be great, having consistent help and having presence within the course in addition to myself. Uh, but also revising a lot of guidelines, providing a lot more depth and uh, detail, I think, will work for me because I learned that the students really want to know more. Mm -hmm. And they want to read long emails and they want to have more depth <laughs> in the rubric. And so I will definitely be providing that. Thank you very much. Drew, we have time for one more on the side. Okay. He's he's coming. He's on his way. He's got one. His, his microphone is approaching you. Microphone is approaching you rapidly here. <laughs> about more information about this entrepreneurship minor that's across the university. Where where is that housed? And is, are there prerequisites, or where do we see that information? Is it open to every student, every major, every minor? Well, Liz Kissenweather, I believe in. Uh, I think Liz is the in Liz Kissenweather is the faculty member that I know of that is heading it up. But Jack can make more comments. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Elizabeth Kissenweather in the department called SEDTAP in the Engineering College is heading it up. But it is a university-wide initiative. Uh, right now, they have it uh, firmly in place in five different colleges at Penn State and they're extending it to the 12 colleges this year and then it's supposed to go out to the branch campuses That's and right. I think you're going to yeah. be working Great Valley Abington and Brandywine uh, are already on, talking uh, to extending it and it's it's a minor what you basic what students basically do is they, they is they take courses that they get credit for, either GA credit or they take their electives in their majors. So uh, I think four of the six courses are handled as part of their regular curriculum. They just have to decide that they want this entrepreneurship minor. And this came about, about four or five years ago when the university realized that we were really entrepreneurs irrespective of what their majors or minors were. And of course, these are the alumni that contribute better, so there's that kind of incentive. But in this changing uh, world today, it's good, even if you're not an entrepreneur, to understand the basic concepts. Like we talk about monetizing here, and that's going to be a significant factor as to how to monetize these courses, because uh, I suspect that the, if you add up all the concentrations, it probably costs a million dollars, would be my incredibly rough estimate for, if you look at everybody, everybody's so-called free time and all the staff help and, and colleges and so forth. So it's an expensive activity. And so how do you monetize it? How do you integrate it into 
uh, world campus. So there's, we call it entrepreneurship, uh, but the principles are basically the same. You're entrepreneuring inside the university. And so it's good and healthy. We know in the engineering college we've had the entrepreneurship minor for over a decade. It's a very popular minor. Uh, and it allows students the flexibility to understand in today's world there is no real job security. The job security is what you have up here, the skill sets you have and so forth. And so that's important in this badging concept. That can't be underemphasized in terms of how do you develop credentials. Right now you just get a certificate saying you took the course, but it doesn't tell you anything about the quality of the work you did. And so badging, I think, is going to become an important part. So all these things come together. Uh, finishing off your question, uh, right now there are a number of students who are in the uh, entrepreneurship minor here on campus. And I can see it going to world campus. As a matter of fact, we're considering or we're going to say that our creativity, innovation, and change course can really be a freshman seminar course online. We can make it that way that would be very attractive, a one credit course, and you think of a thousand freshmen taking it at $500 a credit and you've quickly monetized. And so that's basically the, one of the directions they're going in. Thank you, Jack. And I'd like to thank our panelists for uh, sharing their experience with us. Thank you very much.